Here's a question to kick us off. What is Wonder Woman about? In my review of the Patty Jenkins film, we explored the general throughline of Princess Diana being here to save the world of man from man's own nature, but come on, that's boring, right? Ooh, Wonder Woman's story is about the nature of man. Uh, okay, thanks, Chidi. Let's be real. Every hero's story is concerned with morality in some way, so Wonder Woman's story has to be about more than just that, right? Like, we covered what Wonder Woman's story is, but that doesn't really answer what her story is about. Don't get me wrong, stories don't always need deep, profound messages and themes to be engaging, and in my opinion, always trying to find the deeper meanings to stories can end up being a lot of projection, or honestly just trying to make yourself sound smart. Which, hey, I've done, I'm not immune to wanting to sound smart. But still, I would posit that superhero stories in particular seem to attract metaphors to themselves, like honey drawing flies. Maybe because of all the heavy-handed symbolism involved when dealing with these mythic cartoon characters wrapped in literal symbols. For instance, the easy mode metaphor that we all know is that the X-Men have a deep underlying message of anti-discrimination and anti-oppression. That's their story. We never forget that is what these characters are about, even when they deal with other things during other adventures. Alternatively, Spider-Man hammers in the heavy weight of responsibility, and his films in particular focus on the complex relationship with responsibility as he transitions from boy to man. And The Hulk dives into psychological abuse and trauma, which manifests in larger-than-life ways. As far as DC goes, Superman's narrative has very strong allegories with the immigrant experience. The Flash has recently developed a theme of looking towards the future instead of being burdened with the mistakes of the past. And Wonder Woman is... Well, the premise of her story isn't a big secret, is it? There's no trick here, no hidden gotcha. Wonder Woman is a feminist hero, and her story is about the relationship between men and women. It's about the dynamic, the conflicts, the ongoing conversation between these two genders. This has been the basis of the character. It's a thesis that her stories will return to again and again over the years, even at their worst, and by looking at Wonder Woman's primary stories over the years, we can glean a lot about how different writers have interpreted gender dynamics and put their own mark on this recurring theme. We can also see that not all of these treatises on gender relations are uh, completely above reproach. There are going to be notions in here that deserve a bit of critical thought, but that doesn't prevent these things from being pretty interesting to discuss anyway. Today, we'll be taking a look at how the very first Wonder Woman writer put his own very distinctive thoughts about gender relations onto the very first Wonder Woman stories. Now, at this point, I should probably mention a few wee stuffs. As you might have guessed, I will be discussing things related to gender and women's issues throughout these series of essays on Wonder Woman. I am not a woman. I identify as a cisgender man, so no matter how much I might like or identify with real or fictional women, the fact is that I do not have and will never have their lived experiences and will always be speaking from a second-hand position of not actually knowing what things are like for women. So please keep that in mind and bear with me as I attempt to discuss these things from my limited perspective where my only credentials for talking about Wonder Woman stories is that I am obsessed with the character. Like, I don't think I'm going to be saying anything particularly strange or controversial, but this is the internet and you never know. Fact is, the likelihood of me saying something incredibly dumb does approach 100% the more that I talk, so uh, let's get to it. Thank you. 
At last, in a world torn by the hatreds and wars of men, appears a woman to whom the problems and feats of men are mere child's play. This is the first line of the first appearance of Wonder Woman. Here's issue number two. Like the crash of thunder from the sky comes the Wonder Woman to save the world from the hatreds and wars of men in a man-made world. Issue number three. Into this tortured upside-down world of men, torn by hatreds, war, and destruction comes a Wonder Woman, a powerful being of light and happiness. Man, don't you guys hate how political comics are nowadays? Don't you wish they weren't all about social justice like how it was back in, uh, uh, 1942? It's hard to talk about the ideology behind Wonder Woman without also referring to the ideology of Professor William Moulton Marston, who created and headlined Wonder Woman comics for years. And the good professor was not being subtle. There was certainly an agenda, but it wasn't very secret. As we covered in the film review, Princess Diana's primary mission is to prevent war and hatred. But to Marston, war and hatred are very gendered concepts. They are male. They are rooted in masculine ideals. The world was the way that it was very specifically because men were in charge of everything and effed it all up by being aggressive and militaristic, which is to say by being men. As for women? Well, they're just the opposite, aren't they? Everything would be great if women were in charge because women are bastions of love and compassion. They have it in them to be the loving nurturers of the world, because love and wisdom are women's eternal gifts. If I mentioned that women are loving, have I mentioned that men make war? To Professor Marston, men are figurative literally from Mars, god of war, and women are figurative literally from Venus, goddess of love. And it's through this clash and dichotomy that the narrative of Wonder Woman was created. Mars slash Ares inflames men's hearts with masculine bloodlust, while Venus slash Aphrodite literally created the Amazons, a race of women, to save the world with their loving womanness. It's the ultimate conflict of the sexes, and Wonder Woman's mission in the world is very much allegorical with the loving influence of a womanhood overcoming the violent impulses of men. Quoth the Professor, Frankly, Wonder Woman is psychological propaganda for the new type of woman who, I believe, should rule the world. Again, not subtle. And this is certainly a very radical perspective on gender issues, although, let's be real, it's really not the weirdest sociological thing anyone's ever spouted, even by today's standards. When Marston talks about war and aggression being male, He's basically referring to what we today might understand as toxic masculinity, roughly 40 or 50 years before the term would be used more colloquially. Because whatever you might say about Marston, he was still espousing very um, forward-thinking, progressive ideas in the fields of sociology and psychology that even now is just sort of getting mainstream validation. That being said, his interpretation of this, you know, whatever we want to call it, the toxic masculinity, the badness of men, the lovingness of women, whatever, it does still show its age in several key ways, and I wonder if y'all have already caught on as to how. See, when we talk about toxic masculinity today, we generally understand that maleness and even stereotypically male traits, like aggression and dominance are not inherently toxic or, of course, even inherently male. The problem is not that men are naturally warlike, it's that they become beholden to warlike qualities and dismissive of other qualities like love and compassion and empathy because they think those things are womanly and will make them seem weak or otherwise vulnerable to mockery. We also understand that toxic masculinity is an institutional problem, and not an intrinsic one. What does that mean? Well, the short version is that there are social pressures and social catalysts 
that cause men to behave in the toxic ways that they do. And so if we really want to improve things, we need to examine those pressures and catalysts as the roots of the problem. Again, a girl is not naturally more compassionate than a boy. But if people in general make fun of boys for being compassionate, of course boys are not going to be inclined to be compassionate. Why wouldn't men or even women choose to be toxic when we live in a system that rewards toxicity and punishes introspection? And so the cycle continues. And for all that Marston was very openly aware of creating Wonder Woman as an important role model for readers to learn compassionate and loving behavior from, and for all that he does seem to be aware that there may be deep systemic capitalist issues that cause injustice and sexism and war, he never seems to make that final step, that final logical conclusion to deduce that these exact societal issues might be exactly what make it so that men and women act the way that they do. Okay, I know we're not talking about Steinbeck or Bradbury here. I know we're talking about funny books whose primary target audience was mostly children, about magical superheroes fighting the world war that was happening at the time, but as we examine Wonder Woman and her creators over the years, I think it's interesting to be mindful of the ideological shortcomings of these stories, right along with their many ideological merits, stuff that might only be clear from our modern vantage point. It's what Professor Marston himself would want, I think. And so, it's important to point out that for all that Marston seems to genuinely recognize institutional problems in man's world, and wants to see us all saved by love and wisdom, these comics never truly recognize the possibility that these problems might outright shape men and women's identities in the way that later comic books might seem more aware of. And so, without acknowledging that the nurturing woman or the warlike man are very much social constructs based on social biases, these stories end up with this overall sentiment of biological essentialism, which is its own sort of sexism. You know, it's the sort of self-contradictory thing that says women are naturally better suited to take care of the home, and men are naturally better suited to go fight battles. In a book that's literally about a woman who's better suited to fight than men, you know, because of her super strength, it's... You see where the problem is here. Sometimes I wonder what Marston thought about trans men and women, and if he ever had to address those issues during his time. I'd like to think that he might have been at least courteous about trans issues, but you never know, this was still the 1940s. Also, I mentioned in the movie review that Wonder Woman very much takes on the role of a teacher figure in these stories, while other characters repeatedly come across as wayward children for her to educate. What I didn't mention was that almost every one of these other characters, these misguided souls who were in need of Diana's teachings, were women. Like, Wonder Woman fights men, there are bad men in these stories who need to be knocked down a peg or two, but it seems like women are the only people Diana ever personally takes in hand to educate. There's like a couple younger boys that Diana sometimes acts as a role model to, but otherwise she doesn't really seem to have much to say to men and much more to say to women. You might be a timid housewife who needs to learn how to stand up for yourself and reclaim your power. Or you might be a dastardly villainess who's forgotten your womanly virtues and allowed yourself to be tainted by men's ways. Either way, Wonder Woman will be there to sort you girls out. So on the one hand, this sort of shows how idealistically Marston approached these stories. What I mean is that he very much wanted Wonder Woman to serve as a role model, and specifically a role model towards women. Like, who cares what the boys thought? 
They had other heroes to tell them what to do. Instead, Marston wanted female readers specifically to be able to see themselves as Wonder Woman inspiring other women, and he also wanted them to see themselves as the women being inspired, as being capable of this empowerment and self-idealization. To be fair, there are a couple of anecdotal sources claiming that Marston was writing these stories more for boys than for girls, but you'd be hard-pressed to determine that just from reading these stories. And this is just my guess, but it also feels like a bit of Marston's college professor tendencies kicking in. Working as an educator for all those years, he probably got to see a lot of young people acting in ways that he didn't approve of, and having Wonder Woman personally correct this kind of behavior in his stories all the time might have been drawn from his own experiences, or maybe it's something that he always wished he could do. I don't know, it's just a theory. Either way, Marston gets a whole lot of mileage from this whole theme of Wonder Woman re-educating all these female characters she meets, especially when it comes to female villains. Superman might have the Phantom Zone and Batman might have Arkham Asylum, but Wonder Woman has Reform Island, a recurring location established to be a part of Paradise Island, where Diana can send most of her female rogues off to be re-educated as servants of Aphrodite. It's, it's only sort of mostly kind of very cult-like. But you get what the guy was going for, right? These stories show that everyone, but especially women, have love and goodness in them and can be redeemed, and it's Wonder Woman's job to redeem the women of the world so that they can, in turn, redeem the men. It's charming, right? It, it, it's optimistic. And it has to be said that this mindset of rehabilitating your enemies with love set Wonder Woman apart from the other superheroes up to this point who tended to just toss their villains in jail and wash their hands of the situation. That is, when they didn't just flat out kill the bad guys. Marston very intentionally wanted to show that you can conquer your enemies with love instead of violence, which was still a very fresh concept in the superhero genre. But on the other hand, his approach to this approach does also carry a lot of... Uh, hashtag problematic implications. No, I'm not saying we need to cancel a dead guy from the 1940s, but I'm about to do the discourse on him anyway, because, like I said, I think it's worth doing. For one thing, on top of Reform Island just overall being a super fucking creepy brainwashing cult, having all these grown-ass female characters be the only ones that ever need Wonder Woman to whip them into shape makes these feminist stories overall kinda condescending towards women, especially when you consider that a man was writing all this. No matter what all those text box narrations said about the goodly virtues of women, women in general weren't actually depicted very well in the Wonder Woman comics, barring some notable exceptions. Marston's intentions were undeniably good, and I get that he was trying to speak to the female audience through these female characters, but in practice, what we end up with is one helpless girl after another who doesn't know what's best for herself, one naughty girl after another who's gotten in over her head, who all need to be re-educated by Wonder Woman, who might well be Marston's own self-insert mouthpiece. It's patronizing in all senses of that word, not to mention kind of fetishistic. Marston doesn't leave the men alone, of course. They're also depicted as pretty silly or nefarious, brutish mobsters and so forth. But Wonder Woman doesn't really care about re-educating them. Sure, she'll punch the guy who mistreats women and make sure he doesn't do it again, but as I said, she's not going around making personally sure that Dr. Psycho or, or this guy are getting reformed in the same way that she does for the Cheetah or Paula Van Gunther. 
which gives the impression that women are the only ones who need to learn her lessons. And that's the other problematic aspect of this dynamic, that it makes it seem as if women are the ones who need to change and not men. In recent times, we ostensibly understand that sexism is not just a problem for women. No, sexism not only affects everyone, but more pertinently, men are just as responsible for confronting sexism, for examining our own behaviors and learning quote unquote women's issues. Why should women alone shoulder all the burdens of learning lessons or fixing men? If a man oppresses a woman, we today ostensibly do not say that she should learn how not to be oppressed or that it was her responsibility to not be oppressed. No, we say this man should not do those things. He is the one who needs to learn a lesson. You can't just tell women to be careful of bad men. You also have to tell men to not be bad. So by making women the by and large only recipients of Wonder Woman's lessons, Marston unintentionally makes them all responsible for the problems they face in a way that basically becomes victim blaming. And the clearest way that this mentality comes across is actually through Wonder Woman and the Amazon's own origins. Now, if you're up to date on your silly comic book memes, you might have heard the wacky detail that Wonder Woman used to lose her powers when she got tied up. You might have heard that this used to be her kryptonite, her special weakness. And that is actually not true, exactly. Just tying Wonder Woman up did nothing. One of her favorite things to do was to break out of the ropes or chains holding her down. She loves that shit a bit too much and hey, good on her, own your kinks. Point being, to actually take away Wonder Woman's powers, you specifically had to weld her bracelets together with chains, and even then it still only works if a man does this. It's a very precise process, which of course means it ended up happening to her roughly every other issue. I mean, you'd think people wouldn't just randomly have welding tools on hand all the time to chain someone's bracelets together. Uh, what do I know about the 1940s? Anyway, the reason this happens is because back in ancient times, Diana's mother Hippolyta was basically seduced and tricked by Hercules into losing the magic girdle that gives the Amazons their power, after which they were defeated and enslaved. The goddess Aphrodite, who created the Amazons, helps them to escape with the stipulation that they must always wear their iconic bracelets in order to teach them, quote, the folly of submitting to man's domination, unquote, with the rule where they'll lose their powers if a man welds these bracelets together. Mythological sidebar! This story between Hippolyta and Hercules, or Heracles if you wish, comes from actual mythology, where one of Hercules's twelve labors was to obtain Queen Hippolyta's girdle and Indeed, Hippolyta does give it to him, most usually because she was impressed by or smitten with him. The original myth has a couple of different versions, as many myths do, but all of them diverge pretty sharply from Marston's rendition from this point forward, with either the goddess Hera tricking the Amazons into thinking that Hercules was carrying off their queen, after which violence happens, or that he really does kidnap Hippolyta, after which violence happens, or that she really does leave with Hercules voluntarily, or maybe with his fellow hero Theseus, after which violence happens. Violence happens a lot in Greek myths. In any case, Marston seems to have latched on to an interpretation of the myths where Hippolyta somehow fails the Amazons by falling for Hercules' wiles, or even that she betrayed her people's ideals by outright falling in love with him, and from there constructed this story where she and her people are punished for this, first with their enslavement and then with them having to wear a reminder of their enslavement. Now, credit where it's due. I've always thought that this backstory behind the Amazon bracelets is super interesting. 
It holds a very distinct sort of cultural and religious significance for them, and as much as it originated and could be seen as a mark of shame, as time went on, it became more a mark of pride and even empowerment for them. It marks an Amazon as an Amazon. It signifies their dedication to their lifestyle and beliefs. Yes, it might seem strange at first for people to willingly adorn themselves with a symbol of their subjugation, but a lot of real-life cultural practices are also forced from seemingly contradictory sentiments, which makes this fictional practice seem all the more realistic. It's one of the elements of Amazon culture that not only survived various DC reboots over the years, but whose lore actually got enhanced and even more developed. Heck, it's one of my litmus tests for whether a comic book writer should get to write Wonder Woman at all. If someone doesn't know the significance of the Amazon's bracelets and the history behind why they wear them, they probably don't know enough about Wonder Woman to be helming her book. Also, props to Marston for taking the character of Hercules, this timeless, mythological embodiment of a manliness and a masculine heroism, and interpreting him as the bad guy. It's one thing to make Ares your representation of male brutishness and warmongering. People have done that for ages. But Hercules was and continues to be seen as an archetypically heroic figure, pretty much the very first superhero. Nonetheless, Marston did not pull his punches when it comes to his thesis about male nature. He noted that for all of the mythological Hercules' accomplishments, the guy also very much embodied very many of the very worst aspects of men, especially in this myth that depicts his so-called victory over the Amazons. In the meantime, Marston took one look at the Amazons, a nation of women who often got a bum rap in mythology, and decided to make them the advanced utopian race that would save the world. It's not that the old myths ever outright denigrated the Amazons, but for all that they were technically described as the equals of men by Homer himself, practically speaking, they tended to end up as the losers in their stories, as the barbaric savages who would be outwitted or humbled by the Greeks' real, enlightened, civilized heroes like Theseus and Hercules and Bellerophon and Achilles, to which Marston said, hell nah. The nation of women was going to be the real hero of his comic book, while men like Hercules represent villainy instead. It took, uh, balls to do that. To this day, it's one of my favorite subversions of any narrative. That being said, there's very much an undertone in this interpretation where Hippolyta is presented to have brought on her subjugation on herself, where she should have known better than to let a man overcome her in whatever way. There's an undertone of victim blaming and of even punishing the victims of misogyny with misogyny, where like... You ladies get what you deserve if you let a man dominate you. This message pops up again and again in these comics. You can see it very clearly in the times when Wonder Woman does get caught with her bracelets welded together, and she literally refers to it as a punishment for her stupidity, and it's framed as if she permitted it to happen, you know, as if being physically chained up by your enemies during wartime is something that you just allowed to happen. More insidiously, you can see this theme pop up with some of the other female characters we'd mentioned earlier, where it's suggested that they get mistreated by men because they secretly wanted it to happen or, or, or let it happen and women could just be free if they really wanted to be and everything would be fine if women just let themselves not be mistreated, you know? Like, you get what he's going for here, right? The metaphor is very potent, the message here is very clear. When Wonder Woman lets a man overpower her, she literally loses her powers. 
Per Marston, when women consent, in whatever way, to men being in charge of their lives, they become complicit in their own mistreatment. And look, I wasn't around in the 1930s and 40s. I can't speak to the societal anxieties and frustrations that Marston must have felt about gender dynamics at the time. Maybe there really was a widespread problem back then where women themselves resisted the forward momentum of their liberation movements and felt beholden to the good old days when husbands were the heads of the household and wives were meant to be obedient. God knows that kind of mindset still hangs around today. And not to be too topical, but okay, I can sympathize with Marston being frustrated when a demographic of people not only act in their own worst interests, but actively support the very same forces that are constantly making things worse for them. And yet, it's still important to be aware that those forces exist. And like I said, Marston just generally doesn't make that connection, flip that switch in his head to recognize that women's issues are systemic issues. This, along with the general veneer of victim blaming, is what really makes the Golden Age Wonder Woman comics feel their age, no less than the old-timey vernacular or periodic racism. It's easy to say that women make their own beds by staying with bad men and that they should just own their power if you barely acknowledge that there are structural forces that contribute to those situations. Women who leave their husbands might be stigmatized for it by her peers or even her family. Women who rebuke men can become targets for it without adequate protection from law enforcement or fictional Amazon heroes or any other type of support system. Women who wish to strike out on their own may find less employment opportunities to be able to sustain themselves with. And those are just a few examples out of hundreds of how women might not be able to effectively realize their power in a system that punishes female power while rewarding female obedience. In one story, Marston does depict a woman who doesn't feel like she has any options, and Wonder Woman optimistically inspires her to get strong and earn a living with military positions, and it's... It's not nothing, but is it really that simple? I mean... I've never been a woman in the 1940s trying to make my way, but I can't imagine it was that simple. This is the part where I reiterate that I'm not trying to make a call-out video for this dude who had the best of intentions and has also been very dead for 75 slutty slutty years. There's a certain concern in online discourse these days where the stories and projects that are actually progressive about issues end up being the ones that get overly scrutinized the most and held to an impossible standard that we wouldn't expect from other stories, often by the very same communities that those progressive works are most supportive towards. And I'm guilty of this too, like, who cares what Call of Duty or, I don't know, Supernatural has to say about my issues? They never claim to be saying anything, and so we tend not to hold the things they say to any standards, impossible or otherwise. On the other hand, a comic about Wonder Woman, especially as written by Professor Marston, has a lot to say and therefore a lot to scrutinize. He is the one who very specifically brought these issues up for people to think about, and so it's only appropriate to think about them. And again, I get what he was trying to say and wouldn't be going into his ideology in such detail if I really thought it was just random nonsense. Ultimately, I find Marston's writing of Wonder Woman interesting because you can really map how much of himself he placed into this creation in a more cogent way than you could with most other comic book creations. And just as you can't really understand Golden Age Wonder Woman without understanding William Marston's public ideology, you also can't quite get the full picture without taking a look at his... personal life. So, William Moulton Marston was married to Elizabeth Holloway Marston, 
who was also a university lecturer with degrees in law and psychology, amongst other things. The two of them lived with their domestic life partner, Olive Byrne, in a polyamorous relationship, with Elizabeth and Olive both giving birth to and caring for William's four children. After William died of cancer in 1947, Elizabeth and Olive would stay together for the rest of their lives. Now, we ain't got time to unpack literally all of that, but that there's the background we need for now. In my review of the Jenkins film, I credited Elizabeth Marston as one of the creators of Wonder Woman, to the point of saying that the character belonged to the Marstons. And as we all know, I've never been wrong about anything ever. But if I were, I might have maybe overstated Mrs. Marston's role in all of this. <laughs> There's no doubt that Elizabeth influenced the character a lot, and according to accounts, she's even the one who told her husband to make this superhero he's creating a woman and not a man. But Technically speaking, there's little indication that she had any direct creative or narrative input on this comic book in the way that we would generally associate with a writer or artist. In fact, someone who doesn't usually get the credit he deserves is artist Harry G. Peter, the guy who actually drew Wonder Woman and her comics for all the time that Marston was writing them and beyond that. If there is someone who truly deserves to be credited as Wonder Woman's co-creator, it should probably be H.G. Peter. But again, that doesn't mean we can't see how William Marston drew a lot of inspiration for this character from Elizabeth and Olive. By all accounts, both of them were driven, educated, career-oriented progressives who championed women's rights and yet were also there to support Marston in his home life as loving wives and mothers, however unorthodox their lives might have been. I mentioned that the Wonder Woman comics might, from our perspective, feel a bit condescending towards women, but there's no doubt that Marston modeled his starring character, at least, after the two powerful women in his life who he saw as the ideal feminist women of his time that he wished everyone could take inspiration from. And hey, it would be remiss not to mention Wonder Woman's visual resemblance to these women, right down to her iconic bracelets of submission being based off of bracelets that Olive Byrne wore that apparently symbolized her quote-unquote marriage to both the Marstons, among other things. It also meant other things. Yes, this is the part of the video about bondage. See, the fact that Marston lived a polyamorous lifestyle was understandably kept secret and didn't seem to influence his writing. There's really nothing in Wonder Woman comics about anyone being in any thruples or anything like that. But the fact that Marston seemed to be very well versed in well, we today would recognize it as BDSM culture and didn't actually seem to hide this too much and, in fact, even wrote several psychological papers about the mindsets behind dominance and submission. This? This definitely made it into his comics. Hey, you know Wonder Woman's lasso of truth? Well, it wasn't actually originally the lasso of truth. It just flat out made people obey Wonder Woman when they were tied with it which often included having them tell the truth, yes, but also included just having them be compelled to do whatever she wanted them to. Mez was not being subtle. I've been a little glib about the very, very, very frequent use of bondage throughout Marston's Wonder Woman stories, but the fact really is that his fascination with bondage and other kinks is inextricable from these stories and their messages. And I'm not just talking about the usual getting tied to train tracks kind of shenanigans that you get from the average superhero adventure. I'm talking about very intense, sexual, objectifying, frankly strange situations that Wonder Woman keeps encountering, 
With every sort of fetish on display from bondage to spanking to breath play and submersion and hypnotism, foot fetish, age play, furry play, vor, and at least one case of hair bondage, Marston very clearly, well, knew his stuff. He did not just do some light dabbling in the scene, no. He was well informed about fetishistic practices in ways that would scandalize even the most desensitized internet users of our time, and by that I mean me specifically. And yes, let's be honest that all these kinky scenes of Wonder Woman being put into sexy danger was probably written at least partly just for the horny horny sake of attracting readers to this book that wanted to see hot girls tied up. At this level, it's really no different from all the spine-breaking cheesecake you'd see in modern comics, or the constant panty shots or more from shonen manga. Now, According to what we know from Marston's own account of using Wonder Woman as a tool of education, he was pulling some kind of elaborate reverse psychology uno trick of having boys read this comic for the sexy content only to also expose them to the feminist ideology that is also peppered onto the pages. But let's also be real that all this might also probably just be here for shallower, hornier reasons. But just because the content is horny doesn't mean it doesn't also have a message. Again, Marston depicts the BDSM mindset in such a way that makes it clear he knows what he's talking about and treats this lifestyle seriously. Which, yes, does sound kind of strange if you don't know BDSM culture that well. After all, how can Marston want women to be strong and in charge if he also likes it when they're bound and submissive? It'd be one thing if a bunch of dominant women were tying up men here, right? Instead, the women in Wonder Woman talk a lot about how they really enjoy being tied up and how they love it when someone else bosses them around and takes control of them. But here's the thing. Marston thinks of submission as a noble state of mind, as someone letting go of their aggression so that they can accept love. So men need to do this, obviously, but it's also part and parcel of his Amazonian ideals for women. He also makes it clear that having power over someone makes you responsible for their well-being and safety. Of course, Marston didn't think that women or anyone else should be submitting to tyrants, exploiters, or douchebags. We ain't reading no Fifty Shades of Grey here. Enslaving someone just to make them helpless and weak is the mark of a bad guy in these books. Only the cruelest, most unworthy masters and mistresses would treat people that way, and it's Wonder Woman's job to take those people down and to show them that true and loving mistresses have an obligation to care for their slaves, to guide them on the right paths, to only punish them in order to make them strong and liberated, so that they are able to stand up against the abusive people out there in the world. And so the bond between those who dominate and those who submit is forged out of love from both ends, love and trust from the submissive that their master will care for them, and love and duty from the dominant to care for their slave. It is a rather idealized depiction of an unconventional lifestyle, but it very much mirrors the sentiments of modern-day BDSM practitioners slash advocates and Marston makes this pitch with all his heart, says it with his whole chest. I think Marston and his partners would have liked living in, eh, parts of the world today. I mean, he probably would have been like, What's you two? Why are you making a video about me? But I like to think that he and Elizabeth and Olive would have been pleased at how mindsets have progressed since their day. A lot of what they did would still be considered very taboo to certain people, but there's also a large contingent who have become much more 
understanding, educated, and positive about sexual lifestyles like BDSM and polyamory, and the Marsons would have found a lot more like-minded peers today than they used to. I just don't visit the comments section, Bill. We don't do that. That being said, remember that part of Marston's point was that he already lived in a world of masters and slaves, or dominance and submission. It's just that they were doing it wrong. The warlike nature of man ruled over the loving nature of women in the wrong way. But this dynamic of dominance and submission didn't just pop up in extreme cases. Instead, Marston saw it as a natural aspect of relationships between people, even in healthy relationships, and he depicted this most of all through the relationship between Wonder Woman and Major Steve Trevor. Fun fact, Wikipedia tells me that Steve was designed as a blonde guy because Marston thought that blonde men were naturally more submissive to brunette women. There's no source for this passage, so I don't know where exactly they got it from, but uh, you know what, sure, that does sound like something Marston would believe, doesn't it? Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor's romance takes up a lot of panel space in these books and is another one of those elements that are important to understand in order to analyze this series. Right from the get-go, Diana is very smitten with Steve and it's clear that she competes to become Wonder Woman at least as much to be with him as she does for the sake of saving the world. There's a general dispute in more recent times about whether it's appropriate for a feminist hero to have become that hero in the first place because she fell in love with a man, and I'll touch on this a bit more in my George Perez video, but for now, whatever side of that fence you fall on, I think it's clear why Diana and Steve's romance was important to Marston, considering how invested this series is in the interactions between men and women. And for his part, Steve was certainly very invested in Wonder Woman as well, constantly telling everyone within earshot about how much he loves his beautiful guardian angel who saves him all the time and actually deserves all the credit for all his successful missions. Which is very true, Steve does get into a lot of trouble and hey, even eventually does join in on the frequent kinky misadventures of this series, pretty much filling the position of a male damsel in distress that a lot of other superheroes, female love interests, usually fill. That being said, I feel like Steve still exhibits a bit more agency and, well, competency in these stories than a typical damsel in distress usually does, what with him being a military officer who often gives as good as he gets to the bad guys, and is generally shown in a pretty positive, proactive, well, manly light. Which is interesting, right? One of my favorite litmus tests for stories is to imagine how they would treat a certain character if their gender was reversed, and in this case, we can see that the male character Steve was still allowed to be heroic and capable, even when he was placed in a narrative role that's usually associated with helplessness and victimization when applied to female characters. But I think that was part of Marston's agenda as well. He didn't want his readers to think that submitting to a powerful woman made a man weak, or that only a weak man would allow a woman to dominate him. Instead, he wanted to show that you can be a gallant, manly, red-blooded, all-American war hero guy, and still not only not be threatened by a stronger woman, but also find that super sexy and absolutely want her to step on you. Being comfortable with powerful women made Steve more powerful as well, not the other way around. It made him a better man than he would be otherwise. On the other hand, it's notable that Wonder Woman also had the secret identity of Diana Prince, who was, 
Well, not technically Steve's secretary, but worked for their mutual commanding officer, Colonel Darnell. Either way, Steve still outranked Diana Prince, who acted more demurely and submissively than Wonder Woman did anyway, which flips their relationship dynamic depending on Diana's identity at the time. As Wonder Woman, she gets to be more dominant and assertive, and as Diana Prince, she gets to be submissive and deferential. Marston managed to get his hero to have it both ways. Though, let's also be honest that this was basically a copy-paste of the old-school Superman, Lois Lane, and Clark Kent dynamic, with Steve being in love with Wonder Woman, but not with Diana Prince, and Diana can't just tell him that she's Wonder Woman and yada yada, secret identity hijinks ensue. And sidebar, yes, they really did take one of their first and only female superheroes of the time and made her a secretary. And nowadays, Diana Prince being first a nurse and then a secretary comes across as one of those cringy vestiges of old-timey stories like, hey, she's a woman, so obviously she had to be a secretary even in her own starring series. What else could she possibly do? And I'm not saying the concept ain't pretty dated. That being said, Diana was still a secretary for the army. She worked in military intelligence. She helped to organize wartime missions and cracked enemy codes. Her job was very important and treated that way. Not once does this series ever belittle or otherwise make fun of Diana for being a secretary. Diana herself never complains about her position in any way. And other characters frequently talk about how well she does her very important job and how much they appreciate that. This mindset even carries over to the 70s TV series, where Diana was often respected for her work, not to mention for just being military personnel. Remember that Marston did not think of subservience as demeaning. To him, being of service to the proper authority was a good thing that everyone should try once in a while. Also consider that employment standards were different at the time. Being a secretary might seem like a very stereotypically lowly and sexist position from our modern perspective, but for women in the 1940s slowly breaking out of their traditional roles as housewives and caretakers, secretary work might have been seen as an exciting, empowering office position that women could excel at. It's like the discourse says, is the role actually demeaning, or has it simply been made to feel demeaning because women started to take on the role? Anyway, sidebar over. Point being, Diana and Steve were very into each other and made no secret of it. She was Marston's idealized powerful woman, and he was Marston's idealized man who likes powerful women. But there's a limit to how far either one of them would allow that to go, and these two crazy kids never actually got together. Not that Steve didn't try to make it happen. He spent a lot of panels trying to get Wonder Woman to marry him, while she would always let him down gently but firmly. The idea was that Aphrodite's law forbids Amazons from marrying men in the same way that it forbids them from submitting to men. Because in this heightened world that Marston has imagined as commentary on our world, marriage and submission are one and the same, aren't they? Love and submission are one and the same. Aphrodite's law is the excuse that Wonder Woman would give to Steve about why they couldn't be together. But the running subtext was that marriage to Steve would bind her to him, give him ownership over her in a big way, and that was something that she couldn't allow, even if, deep down, she really wanted that. In addition, there was the general understanding that if Diana ever actually married Steve, she would have to give up being Wonder Woman. By the curious logic of Marston's world, Diana being Steve's wife carried the stipulation of having to give up her own work, her very important calling, so that she could devote herself to their marriage entirely. And to her credit, Diana does know that her mission is too important to give up, 
even for love, which is why she always turns Steve down and, to his credit, he does understand her reasons. Now, obviously, this mindset is reflected in a lot of other superheroes' relationship dynamics, where the responsibility of being a superhero and saving lives outweighs the prospect of living a normal life with your loved ones. And while modern comics mostly suggest that true love can conquer all and that there can be balance between a hero's duties and their personal life if they just work hard at it, there is something to be said that marriage to a full-time superhero, someone who has taken on the obligation of having to save the world at a moment's notice, might not be very fair to their loved ones. This is a frequent source of relationship drama in the superhero genre, maybe because it does make sense and is actually a pretty understandable problem. Still, Marston does put his own brand of gender-based, ownership-based spin on this trope, where marriage meant that Diana would be obligated, as a woman, to quit her job and play the housewife. Diana's constant rejection of Steve can be seen as empowering in its own way. She's establishing her own boundaries and liberties that she won't give up, even for a man she loves. And the fact that she does this so often just goes to show how uncompromising she is about this issue. But still, it's never suggested that Steve would ever have to give up anything. Like, yeah, his job is pretty important too, but the idea that he might take care of the house while Wonder Woman goes out saving the world just flat out never occurs to anyone. Marston obviously based this outlook on the old-timey conservative traditions of his time about proper gender roles with a bit of his own philosophies about domination and submission thrown in. But what's interesting is that this outlook on the role of married women also mirrors the attitudes of the ancient Greek societies that Wonder Woman and the Amazons were drawn from. And considering Marston's apparent knowledge of classical mythology, I don't think that this is a coincidence. Mythological sidebar number two. I think people are generally aware that women had few rights in ancient Greece, especially in Athenian society, with husbands being in charge of everything and wives being relegated to taking care of his household. It's, it's more Game of Thrones than actual Game of Thrones. Women might as well have been property considering the amount of authority that men had over them. And the Greeks themselves knew this. There was this pervasive social apprehension among Greek women that they would have to give up the things they actually liked to do when they got married off, which happened quite early in their lives. Just like in modern times, people were not oblivious to the social issues of their time. They talked about it and argued about it and, as with a lot of anxieties, wrote about it in their stories. So while we don't really have a lot of reliable information on liberated, unmarried women in real ancient Greek life, there was a frequent motif in their mythological stories where women would reject men and marriage in order to do other things that they actually wanted to do. Some of the clearest examples of this are shown through the notorious Greek gods. Have y'all noticed how many virgin goddesses there are on Olympus? The concept of a virgin goddess isn't particularly unique, but three at once in the same pantheon presiding over three wholly different domains? I feel like that's telling me something about the culture in question. See, the Greeks applied the same social mores to their very humanized gods as they did to themselves, and so virginity, in this context, had as much to do with abstaining from sex as it did with remaining unmarried. Being married to another male god meant that these goddesses would have to abandon their own works to attend to his domains. There was honor and respectability in such a thing, especially if you got hitched to the right god. 
Hera became a queen of heaven when she married Zeus, and Persephone is honored as ruler of the underworld right alongside Hades. But just as in ancient Greek society, marriage for a Greek goddess implied giving up on her own personal interests, and so for goddesses like Hestia, Athena, and Artemis, maintaining their marital independence was a very big deal. They got shit to do! They ain't got time to settle down! Even a goddess like Demeter, who is very associated with motherhood and earthly fertility and was known to have taken a few lovers, remained unmarried in the myths, probably in order to indicate to her ancient worshippers that she retained authority over her own domains, her fields of expertise, to such a degree that no god can infringe upon, not even Zeus himself. The only other Olympian goddess to get married was Aphrodite, who was offered to Hephaestus against her will pretty much as a bribe. And though it's not common knowledge nowadays, several ancient sources indicate that Hephaestus ended up divorcing her because the goddess of love cannot be bound in that way. Because she cheated on him. See, to remain unwed was presented as a very deliberate choice for the virgin goddesses. Homeric hymns describe how both Hestia and Artemis very specifically asked Zeus for his blessing to remain maidens forever, which was definitely something that was up to him to sanction as their brother, their father, their king. Yes, even a woman's decision to be free of men had to be authorized by a man. That's just how these ancient people saw things. The point being, while we today might think of women maintaining their virginity as some inherently pure thing or even that they might not like sex or men, to ancient Greeks it also implied that a woman or a goddess had a degree of liberty and self-sovereignty. The goddess Artemis, in particular, was very much associated with this mindset, being specifically deemed as the patron... matron? of young girls, young maidens, and the activities and freedoms that they would enjoy as unmarried virgins. Again, the myths never say that she stayed single because she didn't like men or sex, but specifically more so that she preferred to spend her time running and dancing around in the woods, implying that these are things she could not do if she were tied down. And as we know, Artemis was named Diana by the Romans. Could Marston have been making some sort of statement by naming Wonder Woman, who chose not to be bound to a man in order to continue doing the things she wanted to do, after the virgin goddess Diana, who also chose not to be bound to a man in order to... Yes. Yes, this is not coincidence. Marston was generally about as subtle as a spank on the ass. Wonder Woman's constant rejection of Steve Trevor's proposals is inspired by and a direct comparison with the convictions of the mythological Diana. In addition to the goddesses, various mortal women in Greek mythology also chose to be unmarried and thereby free to do as they pleased, most notably the huntress heroine Atalanta, who incidentally was a devotee of Artemis and eventually did end up getting married, but basically fought against the prospect at every step. There was also, of course, the Amazons themselves, a nation of warrior women who lived entirely without men. It is easy and valid nowadays to interpret the Amazons as symbols of female empowerment and Indeed, this is the approach taken by Marston and most other Wonder Woman writers. But I do have to re-emphasize that the ancient Greeks' depiction of the Amazons was not actually always very empowering or inspirational. They were almost always on the losing side. They were built up as this scary, powerful, conquering army who would get trounced by male hero after male hero after male hero after male hero. Literature and artwork of the Amazonomachy, the battle of the Amazons against various Greek armies, portray the Greeks as bastions of order and civilization triumphing against their savage backwards enemies, much like how similar themes were represented in the Titanomachy, 
the Gigantomachy, and the Senatauromachy. The Amazons were basically entries in the ancient Greek monster manual, right alongside titans, giants, and centaurs. So while the ancient Greeks could conceive of women wanting to be free from men and even an entire nation of women, they also added the caveat asterisk that this wasn't actually a very good idea. This nation of women who rejected men did not seek enlightenment or create great works of art like proper Greek nations did. They just made war and liked killing men. Writers like Herodotus and Aeschylus made very specific points of saying that the Amazons loathed all men. This was basically some of the very first anti-feminist propaganda at work. Women who don't want to be literal property of men are just savage man-haters, right? They just hate men. They don't want to live in peace. If we put women in charge, they'll just devolve into savagery and lop off our balls. Powerful women are scary. These sorts of anti-feminist stereotypes will persist through the ages, unfortunately right up to the modern day and many modern stories. And for all that Marston's reimagining of the Amazons would be kind of weird and fetishistic in its own ways, I will always appreciate that not only did he not mindlessly replicate these old messy stereotypes of a man hating women, he seemed to have set out to deliberately turn these traditions on their heads. So to recap, Marston clearly based this conflict of Wonder Woman having to give up her role upon marriage on both ancient and contemporary traditions about marriage, right up to the part where Diana's resolve against letting a man dominate her in that way is depicted as a strong and admirable thing. But then, that brings us all the way back around to the question of why she would even have to give up her role. Why does marriage have to mean that she belongs to a man? Why can't it mean that Steve belongs to her? Or why does it have to mean that anyone belongs to anyone? Ultimately, I think this just goes back to our earlier point that for all of his radical notions of a better world, Marston is rarely able to conceive of change on an institutional level or of the fact that any institutions might need to change at all instead of just the people in it. It just doesn't seem to cross his mind that we, as a society, can just change the rules about things, even rules that seem very baked in. Now, there is one issue where Wonder Woman and her friends get transported to an evolutionary golden age where everyone lives in peace and men and women share household duties and, hey, to Steve's credit, our favorite himbo does think that's pretty swell. But then the prospect just never comes up again and Steve and Diana go back to enacting the same old traditional dynamics in the very next issue. Like, Marston got so close! Uh, you almost had it, King! But he just doesn't flip that final switch, take that final step into realizing that they don't have to enact those traditional dynamics. Unions between men and women don't have to be any one way, much less this specific way. There's no cosmic law that says marriage has to mean the end of a woman's career. This is a constructed concept, and we, as a people, can deconstruct it. My impression of Marston, gleaned solely from having read a lot of his silly comic books, is that when he talks about having to fix our upside-down world, he's more referring to the people in it, because he doesn't actually dislike the system or society or what have you. People are silly and uptight and repressed in his eyes. People need to change their ways and just let strong women tie them up every once in a while. But the social constructs that define people's problems didn't really interest Marston as the proud American that he was during a time when Americans had perhaps more to be proud of. And this creates what can feel like an unbridgeable gap 
between his ideals and more recent discourse that is generally much more critical of societal nationalistic problems. Perhaps it is simply asking too much of this well-to-do white man from the 1940s with a respectable position to recognize the structural pitfalls of Western society in the more jaded ways that we might be aware of today having the benefits of hindsight and uh, bitter experience on our side. Alternatively, I might just be thinking way too much about this and the actual reason that Marston had this constant marriage ultimatum for Wonder Woman was because this was a serialized cartoon and you just have to tease out relationship drama forever because that's just how you do it. That's just how you get readers to tune in to the next issues can't actually solve any of these characters' dramas because then the story would be over. Speaking of being over, hang in there everyone, we are in the home stretch. I just want to bring up a couple final tidbits about Golden Age Wonder Woman before we lay this whole era down to rest. I mentioned earlier that even though women were for the most part depicted a little unflatteringly in this comic, there were still a couple of notable examples of powerful female characters, and that would be Etta Candy and her Holiday Girls. So early in the series, Wonder Woman needed help to save Steve Trevor from Dr. Poison, and she goes to Holiday College and recruits a bunch of their sorority girls, led by Etta, to uh, infiltrate a Nazi base. Etta and her sorority sisters basically become Wonder Woman's sidekicks slash followers slash students slash hit women, and she would call them on her mental radio whenever she needed their help. Uh, first of all, Marston, your college professor is showing, and I'm not sure I like what I see here. Secondly, Etta herself is very much a clownish comic relief character, by which I mean she is a walking talking dad joke who talks about loving candy at every given opportunity for every single issue for the rest of this comic. Imagine the worst joke that your grandpa ever told and just replay that forever. In this case, the joke is that she's fat and likes candy. That said, Etta and the Holiday Girls are depicted as unambiguously noble, empowered women who stand up for themselves, being genuinely inspired by Wonder Woman's example. They're Marston's way to show that every girl can become powerful if she simply listens to what he, uh, uh, I mean what Wonder Woman has to say. Also, I wasn't kidding when I called them Wonder Woman's personal hit squad. The ladies can throw down. They resort to literal fisticuffs against a whole lot of Nazis and numerous other actual supervillains. So it wasn't just Wonder Woman that evildoers had to be wary of. Mess around with Etta Candy and she'll lay you the fuck out. It's also worth mentioning that for all that we're supposed to think that it's funny that Etta is a fat girl who likes candy. She is portrayed as a very confident firecracker who loves herself and how she looks, no matter what anyone else thinks, and everyone else also really likes her, including Diana obviously, but also Steve and Steve's boss and all the Amazons. So Marston clearly wanted the readers to like her too and like, somehow accidentally stumbled onto body positivity here while constantly making jokes about this character's weight. Etta will change drastically over the next 70-ish years of comic books and periodically get shuffled off to obscure character limbo, but with modern comics being more cognizant of and nostalgic for Golden Age canon, she's kind of come back into her own as a semi-regular fixture of Wonder Woman's life. Diana Prince, Steve Trevor, and Etta Candy really formed the core good guy friend group of these original stories, and I'm glad that more writers nowadays have returned to this dynamic. Name a more iconic trio. I'll wait. Okay, done waiting, we gotta wrap this up. The last big thing to note about Wonder Woman of the 40s is that, like a lot of other comics of the period, it is very jingoistic. 
For all that Wonder Woman was against war as an ephemeral concept, she still worked very closely with the American military, was literally employed as military personnel, never had a single bad thing to say against militaristic institutions, and often exalted the military in all the time-worn patriotic ways that you might expect. Which is completely understandable. We were fighting Nazis at the time. If ever there was a time to support the war effort and our troops, it would be then. But it is still important to be aware of the pitfalls of being so hyper uncritical of the military industrial complex, and we today are lucky enough to be able to do that with all the information and retrospection we have available that Marston and other writers of his time might not have had and could not seek out. Either way, Wonder Woman's direct association with the military will wax and wane throughout the years after Marston, and we'll revisit this issue as well in the videos to come. I think we readers today are savvy enough to understand that, regardless of the character's pro-military backdrop, Wonder Woman was very deliberately created as a symbol against war, as a different kind of superhero who believes in love and reformation instead of straightforward violence, and yet the fact that she still ended up with a military backdrop for so many years is ultimately one of those consistent dichotomies about the character that aren't very easily unraveled. Several of the articles you might read about Golden Age Wonder Woman will mention how the comics started to, uh, get less good after the death of William Moulton Marston, almost as if Wonder Woman had lost the heart and soul of what made her Wonder Woman, and that's not an unfair impression. Regardless of anything, Marston's work on this series the vibrancy and messages and the weirdness that he poured onto the pages was certainly one of a kind. There's also something to be said that writer Robert Knier, who was Marston's predecessor on this book, was perhaps in hindsight not the best choice to fill Marston's shoes, considering that, from what I can glean, his opinions on women and feminism were decidedly different from Marston's, and we'll get into that in the next video. Now, as someone who has been reading comics for decades, I will say that change isn't always a bad thing. Writers come and go, characters go through large and small changes, sometimes for the better and yes, sometimes for the much worse, and Wonder Woman is no exception. And as I hope these series of videos will show, there's a ton we can take away from these older, celebrated stories without exactly overly eulogizing them. I think Marston was a seriously interesting person with remarkable ideas that I've only barely skimmed the surface of, and his contribution to the character of Wonder Woman is undeniable. But at the end of the day, he was just a guy with his own opinions on things, just like you or me, and some of those opinions are thought-provoking, while others deserve a bit of a looking over. For all that he created Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman of today has grown to be more than just his creation with facets to her that Marston would never have conceived of, which is a great thing. And yet, there are important facets of Marston's Wonder Woman, the elemental notion of love triumphing over war, and of women overcoming obstacles and breaking chains, that I both think, and hope, are strong enough to remain with the character, regardless of who has the privilege of writing her.